Uh, let's see what we have. Okay, let's get started. Um, like I said, anyone wants to talk, just um, request the mic and I'll, of course, give it out. If you can raise your hand, fantastic. Um, but honestly, if you have some burning statement or question you need to make, just, just blurt it out. It's all good. Um, we, uh, as you can see up in the space, up at the top of the screen there, we have two fragments, fragments six and seven. They're the ones that we didn't get to last time. Um, we were a little too confident last time, but we're going to read them today. And before I do that, though, I just want to, like we did with part two, I just want to go over very quickly, if I can manage it, I'm kind of long-winded, but go over what we've already read and sort of set the stage for these fragments because it's been it's been a fortnight since we last did this and so maybe maybe the stage we're at is is out of people's memory the um we had the proem right so the the work parmenides fragments it begins with a proem <clears throat> where a youth is taken by a chariot to basically where night and day meet um, and, in the, and then a gate where night and day meet is opened and, and he goes through and he meets a goddess who warmly welcomes him. And the goddess promises that she's going to tell him two things. She says, it's good you're here. Welcome. It's good you're here. And I'm going to tell you two things. I got the book in my hand. Um, again, it's a Phoenix pre-Socratics uh, copy of it. Um, but if you look at the, the tweets for the old spaces, you'll see the screenshots of the fragments. But at the end of the poem... So the youth has uh, been put on a chariot. He's been taken off from the mortal realm. He goes to where day and night meet each other. He goes through the gate. Justice lets him through. And the goddess says, you know, welcome. How you doing? I'm going to tell you some good stuff. It's it's excellent. It's it's great that you're here. And the very last line of the proem, which is the, uh, the second longest fragment, I believe, the goddess says she's going to tell him two things. She says, um, it is right that you should learn all things, both the steadfast heart of persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust. Now, we had very long conversation, or maybe I just talked to myself, but a, we, we spoke about this a lot, about what this could mean, so I'm not going to go over all that. But essentially, that's what's happened in the proem. And I just want to point out quickly because I think this is this is an interesting point that we didn't touch on too much last time. The, the youth or the person who's in that chariot and being brought before the goddess, he's really very, very... Um, he's not active, right? He's not really doing anything in his own right. He's kind of being dragged around. It's He's sort of, I guess, a very quiet and um, pleasant guest. And the host is leading them around because... You know, the mares that carry me as far as impulse might reach. That's the opening line. So he's being carried. Um, they brought and placed me upon the much-speaking route. So he's placed on the route that goes to the goddess. Um, the mares were carrying me. The maidens were leading the way. So really in the proem, the person that the reader is supposed to identify, or I think that we're all supposed to identify with, the youth, we're really, we really have no active role. We really have no responsibility in the problem. We're being led along, and it's like this religious procession almost up into the heavens to where the day meets the night, and we go beyond that dichotomy to this mystical realm to see the goddess. And we really have no responsibilities. We're just kind of being led by the hand or, or, or being taken there. But then... So that's a problem, right? And so we're standing in front of the goddess, and she's all happy and nice to us and says she's going to tell us those two things, which again is the steadfast heart of persuasive truth, and the beliefs of mortals. So we're going to get two lessons from her. But now, at the beginning of the... Uh, well, this is what we covered in part two. So the uh, the beginning of the way of truth. So that was a proem where we, we are brought and we meet the goddess. And now the path of truth begins with her telling us, the goddess telling us that... Or the youth. Again, I think we have to identify with the youth. Because he's the mortal that's been brought up to see the goddess, just like we're mortals who are being who are reading through this revelation. But the um, he's told that he needs to listen, he needs to pay attention, he needs to remember what's going to be said, and he's going to have to convey the story, presumably to the other mortals when he goes back home. So now um, he's kind of like a good student. He does actually have responsibilities now. We do have responsibilities now. When we get to the this way of truth, the goddess is now saying, you got to listen to me. you got to pay attention. 
and uh, you're going to be spreading the good word, I suppose. You're going to be conveying the story. And the goddess begins the way of truth by saying, What roots of inquiry alone there are for thinking? The one, that it is and that it cannot not be, is the path of persuasion, for it attends upon truth. The other, that it is not and that it needs must not be, that I point out to you to be a path wholly unlearnable. Um, and she has more negative things to say about the second path. The reason why I, I, I read that you know, here's where the lesson begins. You know, she said, listen, you're going to have to learn this. You're going to have to convey this story. Listen to what I say. And then she says, there's two things. There's two paths that we can walk down. One, that it is. And uh, one, that it is not. And then she says, you know, the second path that it is not is, is nonsense. You can't point to it. It's not even a real path. But I point that out that there's two paths because at the end of the proem, she said she's going to teach us two things, right? Uh, where is it? It is right that you should learn all things, both the steadfast heart of persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust. So he's going to learn the steadfast heart of persuasive truth and he's going to learn the beliefs of mortals. So he's going to learn two things. But I don't, I don't want someone to think that the two things he's going to learn that the goddess told him in the proem are those two paths. Because... The one path that it is and that it cannot not be is the path of persuasion for it attends upon truth. Okay, we can relate that, as I believe we did in prior spaces, to um, the steadfast heart of persuasive truth. Like, okay, so in the way of truth, we're learning about that first path, that it is and that it cannot not be. And that is, you know, satisfying the promise that the goddess made in the proem, which is, you'll learn the steadfast heart of persuasive truth. Okay, so there's the first promise. You're going to learn the steadfast heart of persuasive truth. We had a big, long discussion about what steadfast could mean there. Um, but that's the first promise. And so this way of truth, or this Alithea, this is going to be about... Uh, this is going to be the satisfaction of that first promise. The it is not and it needs must not be... That, that phrase that is in the Alithea, that is not, in my opinion, relating to the second promise of the goddess, which is, you'll learn the beliefs of mortals. That promise, that second promise, that you're going to learn the belief of mortals, is going to come much later in the way of seeming or doxa. Uh, I'm not going to skip ahead too much, because again, we, uh, we're not there yet. That's not only is it after six and seven, which is what we're reading today, but it's after eight, which is a huge, huge fragment. It's going to take like two or three spaces to get through. Um, fragment nine is the path of seeming. And so I think that promise is going to come later. And the reason I spend so much breath there is because in the last space, we also had a discussion of how to interpret this uh, dichotomy or this these two paths. And uh, I just want to be very clear that in my reading, that second path is not is not referring to satisfying the second promise, the beliefs of mortals. It is um, no real path at all and, and is nothing to do with the truth or what she's teaching us. So anyway, in uh, in this uh, path of truth here, we, we, you know, we were told, listen up, be a good student because you're going to have to go home and tell others about this. And the subject is going to be that it is and that it cannot not be. Um, we had a discussion about what it meant for you know, what? It, what is the actual subject? Like what is being discussed by saying it is not and it needs must not be? What is the it they're referring to? Good question. We had a discussion last time. I'm, I'm reading it as referring to being writ large, like all of existence or just what is. Um, but of course, there are people that read it differently. We, we uh, actually in part one, I kind of introduced a few different readings. Um, but my reading is that very broad metaphysical reading of it or existential sort of being writ large or all that is or what is now we go to where is the next fragment i'm trying i'm just flicking through the book here to get to the next fragment <sighs> you know we didn't mention too much about fragment five um 
It is all one to me. Where am I to begin? For I shall return there again. I did mention in the last space, you know, it could just be the case of the goddess saying, I'm going to be talking about being. Where Whatever I say about being, I return to being in the end. Like, it doesn't matter what I say about being. In the end, I'll still be talking about being or what is. Um, you know, before I started this space, I was thinking another way to interpret it is... Um, it doesn't matter where you start in an account or a presentation of a of a um, of an account of reality or or even any sort of argument, because presumably if you are presenting an argument or you are presenting an account of reality, it all all the points that you make, all the things you have to say, they're all tied together. Although they all cohere into a single sort of reasoning or argument or account, and so. Wherever you start in the account, wherever you start in the presentation, um, you're going to return there again because it, it's all going to tie together. It's going to be one coherent uh, account of reality. And if I talk about apples, that's fine. I can start by talking about apples and what they are and how they exist. And then I can go off and start talking about something else. But I can also return back to that point about apples because it all it's all part of that same point about my argument you know any any part of the argument you select or whatever you're presenting you can start wherever you like because in theory if you have a coherent account of um one thing or one reality it should all tie together it should all be interlocking um it's not like you write out an argument and you write down your premises and then um you just insert a random premise that has nothing to do with the argument for no reason presumably all the parts of your argument cohere or hold together in some way and whichever point you start with, you can return there again in your conclusion because it's somehow related. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm putting too much thought into that. But here we go. Here's the actual <laughs> Here's the actual thing we're supposed to be reading today. Fragment 6. Um, you know, I what I was doing last time as well was I was going to the section of this book where it gives the context for these fragments. And unfortunately, I didn't do that. Here we go. Fragment contexts. Should have done this beforehand. The um, all right. So we're getting this from Simplicius, and we're getting the next one from. Okay, Sextus so Empiricus, Aristotle, Plato. Okay, so all these fragments are okay. Yeah. We already discussed uh, Simplicius's views on Parmenides. Uh, I believe in both part one and part two so i'm not going to go revisit that um i was wondering if there was another author that we hadn't spoken about yet but i can see these uh we talked about sextus as well last time so i'm just going to go ahead and read fragment six uh, like i've done in the other spaces and then make my own comments on it and see what i find useful or, or interesting about it i see we have a couple of new people um feel free to request the mic at any time uh, i'm always open to people you can ask questions but also if, if you've read the text or you find something interesting about it and you want to state it uh you can make your own you know statement or mini lecture on it, it it's fine the uh, feel free to jump in at any point but here we go with fragment six it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is for it is there to be whereas nothing is not that is what I bid you consider. <clears throat> now I'm going to cut it there, just like I've been cutting it constantly uh, throughout all these spaces where I find something interesting. We saw a very, very similar fragment in uh, part two of this space. Uh, fragment four. Um, oh, wait, wait, no, no, no. Fragment three. Here's fragment three. Because the same thing is there for thinking and for being. Um, and we had a we had a very good discussion with um, Ancient on um, Fragment 3. And so I'd recommend going back to Part 2 to, to hear that discussion where his reading of the Greek was essentially thought and its objects are, are being subsumed by or, or, or are part of what is. You know, it's not like thought is outside what is or, or the objects of thought are outside of existence. They are part of existence or I use the term subsumed by existence. And here in fragment six, you know, fragments six and seven, I've seen in the secondary sources, they often get called rather uh, repetitive, uh, which is true. Um, but here in, in fragment six, we see 
it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. Just that first line there, it's the exact same thought, right? It's like, what is there for speaking and thinking? So it's like, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're talking about, it is, because it's there to be. Like, it has some sort of aff affirmative content. It has some sort of presence in reality. So if you're speaking about it, if you're thinking about it, if you're referencing it, just like in fragment three, you know, what's there for thinking? It, it's, if you're thinking, if you're speaking, you have some sort of subject matter or affirmative meaning, uh, it is. That's what he means. It's, it's this affirmative content or presence. And then the next line is, whereas nothing is not, that is what I bid you consider. Now, the goddess has already, in uh, fragment two, ruled out this idea of nothing or is not. Um, but fragment six and seven, again, being they are quite uh, repetitive. I, I feel this is the same sort of comment. It's like, how can you speak or think about nothing which is not if if is is a sort of an existential is or, or refers to any sort of ontological presence or affirmative meaning or anything you can point to or speak or think about then it's opposite if we're going to pretend that there's some coherent alternative or opposite of what is which is a rejected position but let's pretend we're talking to someone who believes that and again the goddess is speaking to a mortal here if if they're going to say well i'm talking about nothing which is not then they should never have said they were speaking about anything right they're not really speaking of anything or thinking of anything um so they haven't really said anything at all it's just gibberish you can only speak and think about what is you can only speak and think about something you can uh identify or has some sort of affirmative presence or you can reference uh, so that's how i read those two lines is very closely related to fragment three but also closely related to the end of fragment two uh, both of which we went over in part two and again i highly recommend going back to the to part two when we were discussing fragment three because uh, i think ancient uh, made some you know had some great input in that in that space now what's interesting here as well when we read on further for i restrain you from that first root of inquiry and then also from this one on which models knowing nothing wander two-headed that i just want to be clear here that what has happened is that the the person translating this or the fragments that we have i believe they, that there's a problem in that a word has dropped out of it or the scribes they failed to transcribe a word uh, because the meter is broken and so they've had to um they've had to reconstruct it and there's a few different ways of doing it i think this one is kind of awkward because it says for i restrain you from that first root of inquiry which is the first root that the goddess is restraining us from it can't refer to the top of fragment six because the first root in the so we have two lines at the top of fragment six the first root is that what is there for speaking and thinking of is for it is there to be it can't refer to that because that's that's the only thing that we can talk about in the goddess's mind um whereas the second line is nothing is not that is what i bid you consider it's that root of inquiry that nothing is not uh that is being um that, is, that the person is being held back from the um so you know there's a lot of ink spilled on how to reconstruct this but essentially what i think she's saying is the first thing that she's going to restrain us from so the the first root of inquiry that that is to be restrained from is that it is not or nothing that root of saying that things are not that one is what she's restraining us from and then the second because she's saying the first root of inquiry right so what's the second one that she's going to restrain us from she's going to restrain us from the mortal beliefs now we know from fragment one the proem like what's the last line or the two last lines or three let's do three the beliefs of mortals in which there is no true trust but nevertheless you shall learn these things as well how the things which seem had to have genuine existence permeating all things completely okay so 
she's withheld us in fragment six from considering one the nothing you know that it is not she's she's restraining us from that and then she's saying and then also from this one on which mortals knowing nothing wander two-headed so she's also going to restrain us uh, from that option um, which she purported that she was going to teach us and so it becomes a question of in what sense is she going to restrain us or to what extent is she going to talk about it because for nothing is not or that it is not she's not going to say anything other than it's just totally illegitimate and makes no sense and is gibberish but for this other thing she's restraining us from yes she's going to restrain us from us from it but she's also going to let us tread it a little because what did she say at the end of the poem she says it has genuine existence because genuine existence permeates all things completely so i had that digression because it's unfortunate there's a word or two that have dropped out of the text here um and that you know, scholars are kind of saying, look, the meter of this poem is broken. We have to repair it somehow. This is one of the ways that they've repaired it. But to be very clear, when she says that she's restraining us from that first root of inquiry, it's it's applying, I believe, to the nothing is not in this um, in this reconstruction. And then um, the second root of inquiry that we're going to be restrained from can, it has to only be a partial restraining or maybe a, a redefining of it because there is some genuine existence in what the mortals uh, believe. But anyway, this is a description now of that of that second promise that, that she's going to teach us the mortal beliefs because it says, And then also from this one, on which mortals knowing nothing wander two-headed for helplessness in their breath, breasts guides their distracted mind and they are carried deaf and blind alike dazed uncritical tribes by whom being and not being have been thought both the same and not the same and the path of all is backward turning so here we have this is this is like i'm saying it's going directly to the second promise that the goddess made us not just that she'll tell us the steadfast truth but she's also going to tell us about the flawed beliefs of mortals and why are they flawed she kind of gets into it in the poem a little bit but she also says you know there is some truth in there it does have genuine existence but here she's getting more in depth she's saying that the mortals are wandering two-headed um how can it be two-headed at this point well we get it at the last line of fragment six by whom being and not being so presumably the first route from fragment two and the second route from sec fragment two uh have been thought both the same and not the same and the path of all is backward turning so i this is this is the end of fragment six but i see this last point as saying look the reason why the beliefs of mortals are untrustworthy and the reason why these people are wandering two-headed and they're helpless and they have a distracted mind and they're deaf and blind and dazed and uncritical is because they did not carefully consider whether there is one or two paths they just assumed there was a path of it is not and then as they walk the path of saying what is they also try to talk about not being or what is not and so they're kind of wandering around two-headed, trying to look in two directions, where you can only legitimately look in one direction. Um, so they just, they get lost and confused on that path of what is, because they thought contradictorily, I mean, it's a contradiction to think this, but they thought that there was also an is-not that they could insert into their account. They made that assumption. And because they had these two things, what is and what is not, they're dazed, they're uncritical, they didn't think about their assumptions, they're deaf and blind to the truth, they're just wandering two-headed, and they don't get anywhere. Which is essentially what I think of most philosophy, that it's uh, two-headed, doesn't get anywhere, it's uncritical, it, it made certain assumptions at a metaphysical stage, and as a result, everything that follows is worthless, or not worthless in a practical sense, maybe they, they can make beautiful artwork or they can reach some sort of scientific development or something but 
it, it, it will never be an accurate account because in its heart it's corrupted. It has this idea that there both is and there is not. It is that two-headed uh, idea. And that two-headed idea is nonsense and will always fail. So the um, that's fragment six. And again, just to very quickly recap, the beginning, uh, very similar to fragment three, uh, about saying like if you're speaking about something, you're thinking about something, it is. There's something there to be spoken of. And this whole process, it all is. Um, so he's essentially, you know, casting that net. How wide is being? How wide is what is? It's so broad, it's so wide that it captures anything you could speak about. It captures anything you could think about. And depending on how you read fragment three, it even captures the idea of speaking and thinking. That's how broad being is. Or how broad what is, is. Um, and in that huge breadth that kind of cuts out that second path from the picture. Which again is why the second path is completely you know, gibberish. It's illegitimate. Then the goddess says... It's kind of a reminder. Again, this is a very repetitious um, fragment. Kind of reciting or restating what we've already heard. But she just reminds us. I'm restraining you from talking about what is not. And then she gives us more information about that second promise she made about teaching us the beliefs of mortals. She said, previously she said, the beliefs of mortals have no true trust. They're not trustworthy. Now she's saying, again, they're still not trustworthy, but it's because they're two headed. It's because they mixed ideas of what is with this gibberish about what is not. And that's why there's no true trust in it. That's why they're confused and all their teachings are ultimately worthless, uh, which is my belief as well. I believe all the teachings are ultimately um, corrupted or worthless because at the heart of their metaphysics, uh, they have this error or this assumption. And um, metaphysics being the broadest of all, it sets the context for everything else you say. If, if, the, uh, if the context or the system or the structure within which all your statements are supposed to be interpreted, if that structure is rotten, um, then all your teachings are rotten. And maybe there is some, some use for them, but, but they're just fundamentally rotten. And so Aristotle, Plato, all the Germans, everyone else, their, their teachings are all rotten, in my opinion, because they, they are wandering two-headed, as the goddess says here. Uh, but maybe that's too harsh. Um, you know, they're not here to, to defend themselves, I guess. A fragment seven is the next one. Again, if anyone wants to comment, feel free to request a mic, but we're making good time. This is going to be one of the quickest spaces, actually. Um, fragment seven, again, very repetitious. But I will, I will just read it. I'll read it in full, and then I'll go back over it. For never shall this prevail, that things that are not are. But do you restrain your thought from this root of inquiry? nor let habit force you along this route of much experience to ply an aimless eye and ringing ear and tongue but judge by reasoning the very contentious disproof that has been uttered by me you know the last two lines there i have a lot to say about but let's let's start at the top here for never shall this prevail that things that are not are I mean, how, yeah, how would it not be a contradiction to say that the things that are not, so they are not, are. And what I love about this translation is it gives a number of different, um, different alternative translations and the one in the main body of the text. So you can see in the screenshot here, uh, that line is 7.1. And it says, um, here are some alternative translations. For never shall this be forced that things that are not exist and another alternative for this shall never be proved that the things that are not are again it's this is very much in keeping with what we saw in fragment six um and fragment two really um and it's to me it just reads like a like a direct contradiction if, if someone came to me and said, these things that are not, they are. 
it, it, it's just it's a direct contradiction of saying that something is and is not in the same sense at the same time. It's just a very clear contradiction to the point that if you denied this, then nothing else you say could be coherent. It's it's like if I said, well, it is an apple and it is not an apple in the same sense, same way, same everything. It's like, well, then how can I interpret anything such a person says? Because if they affirm anything, if they posit anything, if they put something forward, it's as good as them having not put it forward. Um, so it, it, it's just like it destroys language to deny this. It destroys meaning to deny this. Um, the other thing is it's also stressing the, in my opinion, because again, I, I'm thinking that being is this very broad existential sense of being or what is. It's sort of stressing that further, right? So the things that are not are. So it shows that that first path of what is, it, it, it's encompassing, again, everything, literally everything that, that is, or the, I mean, the grammar here is they are, not are, but it's almost like you could cut off the word are here. All right, so let's back up. Let's cut off the word are. For never shall this prevail, that things that are not. The, yeah, so you don't even need the word are here to recognize a contradiction or a problem because if I am if I am even saying that there is and is not like um, oh here's the thing that is not already there is a contradiction just in just in positing something that is not like oh yeah I was talking yesterday about the thing that is not when I said that I am talking about it well, what's the first line of um, fragment six that we just read? It must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. So what is, or the extent of being, encompass ev encompasses everything that can be referenced. It's like referenceability. And so if you, not even getting to the point where you say, well, what is not is. Like, no, just saying that you're talking about what is not is enough to, to posit the contradiction. Because if you are talking about it, it necessarily can be talked of. If you, are, if you are putting forward an argument, for never shall this prevail, that things that are not are. If you're putting forward this argument, and in your argument you have said that there is and is not. There is a thing that is not, or things that are not. You've already broken the top of fragment six. You've, you've already broken whatever account is being put forward here. Um... You, yeah, you've just mired yourself in contradiction. So, the top of fragment 7, again, it seems to me to tie into fragment 6, which tied into fragment 3, and follows the dichotomy that we see in the beginning of, or the middle part of fragment 2. So it's all flowing together to me quite well. Um, and I just read that first sentence as saying, look, don't pretend you can talk about what is not. Uh, or that you can pretend to affirm what is not, or you can posit a what is not. Or, if you're one of these people who believes in becoming, um, like Germans and others, the the is not that you are that you are positing and that you are relying on in your argument um, is illegitimate. You, so you can't even begin to rely on it. You can't even assume that there was an is not to help you make whatever case you want to make. It can never prevail that you could even have that stepping stone. Um, we see people like... Um, oh, I got an email. The uh, We see people uh, like Plato so in, in his Sophist and others. They're so desperate to maintain a certain model of change that they'll posit what is not. And they'll, you know, they'll tie themselves in knots trying to do it. Um, but never, they'll never even get to that point of being able to affirm or to assume that there is such a thing as an is not. Uh, upon which to build their arguments. Uh, so really, for, uh, Parmenides is cutting off these presentist models of change at the knees. He's like, they're dead on arrival. Um, so, again, much of what I read, and I don't read too much modern philosophy, but the um, much of what I see other people talking about is just dead on arrival um, because it relies on saying that the things that are not are or somehow positing them uh, at the beginning of the space, I believe before we turn the mic on for YouTube, but beginning of the space, we were saying 
you know, what do I think of models of change? And I said, well, I cannot accept any model of change where a future moment is not, and then it comes to be. Um, again, there is no, you, you will never prevail that the things that are not are, a future moment that is not can't be grasped and then thrust into what is because it's not there to grasp. It's not there to become. So, you know, that's a lot of words, uh, but that's what I make of that first sentence. And again, repetitious as it is and, and relating back to other fragments, but the, um, but the point is very critical. Um, it got us again. Do you restrain your thought from this root of inquiry? You know, fragment six where they re uh, reconstructed the third line, uh, and I talked about for uh, probably too long just now, where I said, uh, for I restrain you from that first root of inquiry. What is the first root the goddess is referring to? Um, and should the I restrain even be in there? That's where the word dropped out. Well, if we, um, if we look at fragment seven, it says, but do you restrain your thought from this root of inquiry? So again, fragments six and seven very similar subject matter, very close together. I can see why they flow from each other, like one follows the other, but the um, or why you'd put these two fragments next to each other. And actually, the the second the, the sources that preserve these fragments are also, I believe, Sextus Empiricus says that these two fragments go together. But the um, but the goddess is also saying in fragment seven what she's going to restrain the the reader from or the youth from. And she's restraining the youth from thinking about things that are not, right? Because what's the first sentence? Never shall this prevail, that things that are not are. But do you restrain your thought from this root of inquiry? What was the line in fragment six? For I restrain you from that first root of inquiry. Okay. So here we have a, a, a clearer statement that that root of inquiry of which we're being restrained from is to do with the claim that things that are not are. Okay, so we've been restrained from that avenue. <clears throat> and then she says, nor let habit force you along this route of much experience to ply an aimless eye and ringing ear. Um, you know, in part one, I was always picking out the parts where the path of truth or what the goddess was favoring was using words like much or many or plurality because again i want to preserve all possible meaning i don't want a uh, i don't want a meaningless parmenides where there's no meaning in the universe or meaning to being um, there needs to be content to being right it means something being is something um so i was picking out which you know, why would I be picking them out on this particular point? It's because Parmenides is often presented as someone who perhaps is destroying all meaning, perhaps destroying all complexity and denying it all, whereas I don't read it that way. Uh, but we see here, again, there's another polyperon. So polyperon, so much experience. So the um, again, the goddess is describing the route that they're following as being much experience, um, you know, where is it? What do we got here? Um, yeah, born of much experience, much experience, many experiences, whatever, however you want to phrase it. Again, it's a, it's a plurality. And again, that this plural term or this, uh, complex term or this meaningful term, um, it's the route that it's a route or route that we're following. Um, uh, but anyway, she says, to ply an aimless eye and ringing ear and tongue. So never let habit force you along this route of much experience to ply an aimless eye and ringing ear and tongue. I'm going to cut it there because, you know, it's sometimes what you'll see when people discuss Parmenides or other Eleatics, they'll say that they outright deny the senses. Like they outright deny that there can be any truth or any trust in the eye or the ear or the tongue or, you know, what you see here or, um, well, tongue here is going to be speaking, I guess, but taste. And the, um, that's not really what's been done here. It's more like letting those, in my reading, it's more like letting those things run away with you. 
like an aimless eye, a ringing ear and tongue, like getting caught up in these arguments and these sensations. Like, don't get caught up in the, in that. You, But it's not that there's no no value or truth or existence in them because again what was at the end of the of the first fragment let's go back just very quickly to the very last two lines here well not even the last two lines it's uh, how the things which seem had to have genuine existence so don't let them be aimless don't let them confuse you and ringing eye uh, ringing ear and tongue and lead you astray but I don't read that as going to the next level, which is that they're completely worthless. So if someone, and I only I only stress this point because sometimes people do say that Parmenides is, you know, pure reason and uh, we should deny all of the senses, deny all of that data. Uh, and I don't think that's what's being said here. Because what is the next line? Well, before we even read the next line as well, in Melissus you see something similar. I don't have a copy of Melissus's fragments in front of me, but essentially he says, you know, there's fire, water, iron, earth, all these other things. Um, and he doesn't necessarily object to them. What he objects to are these accounts of how they become one another or they change or shift. That's what he has a problem with because he thinks that those claims or those accounts of how things change, like how fire can be doused by water, that's not, a, not an example he gives, but let's say... Okay, like a ring, if you rub it with your finger, you can wear down the metal. That account of it being destroyed or shifted, he disagrees with. But he doesn't strictly disagree with the idea that there could be fire or water or iron or that you could see these things. It's more about how do you interpret them or do you let yourself get led astray by your senses? Because the senses gave you some data, but don't read too much into them. Because whatever you read into them, it has to accord with reason. It has to accord with being. And I think Melissa's last word on that point is, you know, if we accept that there are the, these things like uh, fire and water and whatnot, let's say we can accept them. They have to be of the same nature as the one or as being. So it's not that the eye and the ear and the tongue and whatnot, you have to ignore it wholly. I don't think that's a fair... Uh, well maybe it's fair but it's not the way I read that rather it's saying don't let them lead you astray don't go overboard with that because and what's the next sentence judge by reasoning the very contentious disproof that has been uttered by me so whatever the eyes and ears and tongue are, are feeding you um, whatever accounts of reality you're being given that tie them all together um judge by reason don't just uh, be led astray by them don't don't give give assent to any sort of model or account or claim regarding them just be very strict about how you interpret them and use your reason and this last line is is interesting because the um let's read a couple of these other translations here because i have something to say about these last two lines so the last two lines i'm referring to are but judge by reasoning the very contentious disproof that has been uttered by me. And so a couple of other translations are the much contested argument which has been given by me or the much disputed proof uttered by me or the strife encompassed proof that I have spoken or the very contentious challenge. So obviously a lot of these authors or translators have struggled or, or have felt the need to translate this um, contentious disproof or uh, poly dirin again I don't speak Greek as I mentioned in the others but elenkon okay so yeah okay so all right having done a little bit of my own research and, and understanding these phrases to some extent the contentious disproof here can also be understood as a um, like an account or an argument because um, you know there's also another angle to this so elenkon here this is a very ancient greek term you can find in homer and elsewhere where it is something like um and in bacchylides and, and other um i guess dark age <laughs> i mean pre-parmenidean texts um or if it's even a text i mean it's, it's an oral tradition right the um for homer but the um 
it's almost like it's uh, the Elencon is sort of a, a shame at having failed to live up to something or failed to pass a test. And then as time goes on, as I understand the etymology, it became known as that test, like the test itself. So you may have like a warrior who has, you know, he wasn't valorous enough or he didn't succeed in some endeavor or live up to some standard of bravery. And so he is Elencon. Um, you know, he, he's ashamed because he didn't live up to that standard. And then you may have it understood as the standard itself, like the test, the thing that is used to test. So maybe, um, you know, a, a test that a warrior could go through will then be the Elencon. And, um, and then it becomes just a way of saying, like, a, it's said here as a disproof. Uh, it could be in translated as a proof, or it could be translated as an argument. Um, and so you could also translate it as, as an account. Like uh, we sometimes translate our logos as an account or word uh, or words about something. And so what I would suggest here is, um, but judge by reasoning the very contentious disproof that has been uttered by me. I would I would say that um, maybe one way and, and the way that I would understand this is she's saying take the aimless eye ringing ear and tongue take all that sense data or what you experience what you're aware of take all of that and then judge it with reasoning um, logoi yes yeah, so it's, it's using logos there or judged by words or reasoning I guess there but the um, using her model her contentious model uh, or her contentious proof or her contentious account um, so but judged by reasoning the very contentious disproof or account that has been uttered by me so I think she's asking the the youth um, to judge what he has to say about reality or his experiences of reality or these various claims um, or what is said um, with the proofs that the goddess has put forward or with the account that the goddess has put forward and of course is a very contentious is a very um, you know full of strife or battle or combat or contested because what she's saying is extremely controversial and of course it overthrows all of the two-headed mortal beliefs um, but yeah I think she's saying essentially never let habit force you along this route of much experience to apply an aimless eye and ringing ear and tongue don't when you're engaging in philosophy when you're talking about what is don't let it uh don't fall into the aimless eye ringing ear and tongue but use your reasoning apply her model or her proof or carefully consider with your reasoning her proof and uh it's like a request asking the student to do that so that's how i would almost uh apply the end of fragment seven there and well i'm not going to go into fragment eight because fragment eight is the longest fragment it will take us two or three spaces to get through hopefully two i'm hoping we can get through it in two um but for six and seven i think i think we've teased out much of what i have to say on just a casual reading through it here um it's, it's essentially six and seven quite repetitious but but just strengthening things we've already read in the prior fragments and um and reminding us of what we ought to be doing which is focus on what is i'm restraining you from the gibberish and nonsense of saying that there is and is not um but now keep in mind that all those mortals and all the things you hear and see it's all two-headed nonsense because it's all built on the um on the assumption that there was and is not so you need to be careful and not be and not just follow an aimless eye and a ringing ear and an aimless tongue or a ringing tongue but instead use your reason take that sense data or your awareness or your experience or what you are because again we are part of being we are subsumed by being and everything we experience and all these accounts what do we see at the end of the problem have genuine existence so she's saying take that stuff it's genuine but judge by reasoning uh and apply the um the contentious uh account that she has uttered so that's kind of our mission 
at the beginning of fragment two, we got our mission, right? So fragment one, the proem, we were led there. We didn't have to do anything. We just kind of got stuck on a chariot. We got taken up to the heavens. We passed through the gate and the goddess was nice and took our hand and sat us down and welcomed us. Then at the beginning of fragment two, where we start the path of truth, we got told our mission. It's to listen, pay attention, because you're going to have to go home and convey this story. And now in uh, fragment seven, we have a reminder of that mission. Um, don't get led astray by common accounts and by your sense perceptions, but use your reason or your logoi and apply the goddess's um, account, a contentious account and a much contested argument. Um, and that's, that's the method that we're going to be doing now. So, you know, that's all I had for six and seven. I think, um, you know, they're sizable fragments compared to much of what we read um, during part two of the space. But the, um, I think, I think they tie in well. Um, again, very repetitious, but they tie in well. They touch on a lot of points. Um, they flesh out the second part of the promise. Um, you know that she's going to teach us the beliefs of mortals. That second half of fragment six. And uh, I think it lines us up really well for Fragment 8, which is um, where it's all going to go down. Fragment 8, I think, is the um, everyone's bread and butter. I mean, they all love Fragment 8. Fragment 2 and Fragment 8. Um, and Fragment 3 to some extent. But uh, we'll get to them next time. So if we have any comments, uh, let me know. We see uh, Tycho. Uh, if you would like to speak, feel free to do so. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I wouldn't comment or anything like that. I, I just um, you you wouldn't mind having the discussion about um, change a bit more, essentially, right? Um, I guess uh, I guess I should ask the question of um, where do you think sort of like possibility sort of fits in into this metaphysic in some way, right? Because I, I can sort of I think when what most people think about when they when they when they mention things that are possible that is to say like things that could be right they're not really talking about something that is um as in it as in is it has being itself right but also they're not talking about something that does that can't possibly be in any way like that that isn't um i'm, I'm so essentially I guess I'm asking like where would where would where would possibility fit in this into your in, into this metaphysic yeah no the um, there's a few things I could say but uh, <clears throat> to your last point there which was um, the um, hold on, I'm just opening the book again I, cl I closed the book so I'm just uh, just opening it again the um, you mentioned that um, they could be talking about something that could not possibly be. Uh, maybe I'm misrepresenting your words there, but I think you you are talking. You, you mentioned there that people could discuss or say something that is not possible. And for that, I think the first line of fragment six, right? So the first line of the uh, fragment six that we read today, it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. So if you've identified something. Um, and you're terming it the that which is not possible. Um, if you have actually identified something there, to the extent that it has meaning or you've identified something, it is what is. It's, it's within being. It's on that first path. Uh, because again, how could you be talking about it if it was not? So, So it's almost worth a discussion of um, what did you mean when you said that there are things that are not possible? Um, if if I were to say something is not possible, maybe we are looking at um, we are looking at where is that fragment? Uh, yeah, fragment seven, right? The first line of fragment seven. I, I went on a little rant about how it's a direct contradiction, and the words will become gibberish, like saying that that which is not is. Or even just trying to affirm a, an is not. Because again, top line of fragment six and elsewhere, we see that by definition, if you're affirming something, it actually is. So you're kind of contradicting yourself by saying that it is not. Not you, I just mean generally. And so 
the um, I think there there would have to be some discussion of what we mean by something not being possible. One way is to just say it's a direct contradiction, um, like saying, "Oh, I'll have a um, I'll have a square circle in some geometry where they're not, you know, where you can't have that. It's a direct contradiction in that s geometrical system." Um, and so then you're not really saying that there is a square circle, and and it doesn't and it's not possible. What you're saying is you're kind of fleshing out the border of the system or the border of what is possible, and you're saying here's where it ends. Here's where coherence ends. It ends at this point of contradiction, and you can't go further. Um, so you could be saying it's not possible to go further. Um, because to go further would be a direct contradiction and there's no meaning in a contradiction of that sort so maybe that's that's one way you can talk about what is not possible um, but if we're just identifying something you know like oh it's it's not possible for me to throw well I don't want to make it like a, a random example but the um, I would just say that if you are identifying something to the extent that you've identified something uh, it does exist. Um, and then in a system of change, so the first part of your question was about change. And the um, it's like, how do we, how do we, um, the question is, now I'm trying to recall the first beginning part of your question, but how would I deal with possibility in a model of change? I would just say that anything that is possible is necessary, right? So there's another thinker, uh, Diodorus Cronus, who I think is very closely related to the Eleatics, uh, like Parmenides and Melissus and Zeno. Um, to the extent he gets lumped in with them at, at various points. Um, I think we mentioned Sextus Empiricus in this space. We mentioned him in another space, uh, a part two. And um, yeah, Sextus Empiricus lumps him in with the Eleatics. Um, and essentially his position is that whatever is possible is necessary. So again, without more information from you on your thoughts of what possibility entails or how to define that term, I would just say that if you have a scenario where some event is possible, I believe that it is necessary. Um, and how would you model that? Well, for me, it's going to involve branching, you know, branching plot lines, I guess. Um, but I'm not saying it's the only way you could model it. I, d I don't know what other people come up with. But, but yeah, I would say that whatever is possible is necessary. And when you say possible in the context of change, possible is more like a relative term like uh, you're just kind of identifying all the things that I'll do so for example is it possible for me to throw a rock onto the roof yeah it's possible because it because it can be done and it will be done at some point because if it's possible it will occur but then if you said you know is it possible for me to jump up into outer space given a certain model of physical reality and um and my and what I am in that model, the answer would be no, it's not possible because it would be a direct contradiction to say that in this model, this degree of energy or this entity could jump to that extent, uh, which I can't. I don't think I can jump to space. Uh, so it'd be a sort of a contradiction um, in the model. So I guess in that sense, you could say it's impossible. But, but whatever is possible, I would say is necessary. I hope that helps. Um. Um, and you are defining possibility in terms of um, whether there's a logical contradiction. Uh, yes, impossibility. Yes, I, I was identifying impossibility as a as a contradiction. Oh yeah, sure. Um, um I guess I am still having this sort of contention. You see, um, I think when I started working on my interview, I sort of had uh, a intuition when it comes to being to be the same. Well, being has to be um, one way and not not in the other way in some way. And that is to say, um, which isn't, right? Yeah, okay. Um, you're breaking up a bit, but I think I heard what you said, which is that you had the intuition... Oops, are you able to mute your mic? Take a, sorry, yeah, it, it was breaking up a bit there. I don't know if it was um, your connection or, or the wind. But the um, I think I think what you were getting at is that you had an intuition that being has to be one way and not another way. Um, and, of course, in 
in your account or understanding of reality being maybe defined a certain way and you have other terminology uh, that you apply I would um, for this idea that being is one way and not another way where we're identifying another way the uh, again just going to the fragment six I think you would be using being in a different sense than what the goddess is using it because again the beginning of fragment six it must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is for it is there to be so if you have um, if you have these various uh, I guess things and one of them you call being and another one you call beyond being and another one you call not being um, and being is this thing over here and non-being or beyond being is that thing over there uh, I think we've just reached a point where different definitions are being used because the way that the goddess is using it at least in the top of fragment six and at other parts of the text that we read through on other occasions the um, being is being used in a sense to capture all meaning to capture everything that you can speak of uh, which also goes into why i was defining um impossibility in terms of a contradiction or something that doesn't cohere because I don't want to posit something beyond being or beyond what is. I would just use it. I would use terms like is not or, or impossibility to identify sort of the limit of what is or, or how far a person's words cohere or how far their claim captures some meaning or, or how far there is something. Um, and to the extent that they think that it's that it's captured more than that, I'm just like, no, it's it's incoherent or it's impossible or it's a contradiction um so that's kind of why i was doing that but no but if if we have a system where we're saying like this part this thing over here is being and it's that way and the things over here are the things that don't exist or are beyond being then i think we've i think we've changed the definition of being we've we've changed what we're talking about uh from what is being said at the top of fragment six and what is being said throughout this poem because to the extent that these alternatives or these different paths or way or ways have affirmative meaning or content or can be spoken of then they are all being because being is all subsuming it's again i did i already did the first line of of uh number six but um what's the bottom part of the problem here not only does she say that things have genuine existence but genuine existence permeates all things completely so whatever can be mentioned uh is permeated by being uh oh we have a we have a microphone request from indigo uh i'll give you the mic taco if you had anything else to say let me know um but i'll give the mic to indigo in a sec oops oh it dropped away hold on okay there you go Uh, Taiko, did you have anything else to add? It had a lot of wind on on uh, on your side, or a lot of static, so I'm not sure if you can talk. Um, if you had nothing else, I'll I'll give the mic to Indigo. Um, is it now? Uh, sorry, I, I I'm not sure if it's a problem for everyone. I I just can't um, make it out. It's like very crackly, or like there's some interference. All right, um, Indigo, please, um, you have the mic. Please feel free to chime in. Thanks. Uh, a little late coming into the space here, but um, you kind of answered the point I was going to bring up in your last um, edition, but about like coexistent being, about how two things can be, but that doesn't really negate each other. Uh, especially like when you were talking about like the divergent paths. Um, but what do you? I just wanted uh, some clarification on what you mean by necessary. Do you mean that the being, the existence of it, is necessary if it is to be? Um, yeah there's two kind of questions there so one of the challenges in answering taika was there was <clears throat> a question that related specifically to change like the first half of his question to the extent i i was able to hear it was about change and uh what makes something possible or impossible and then just a general question about impossibility or, or how i interpret it as something to do with contradiction or what is not um but going back to to change and branching paths 
now I feel like your question has kind of two avenues as well because one was is it necessary for being to be um, which is not something I really relate to change so on that point like is being necessary uh, yes because there's only one so for something not to be necessary there should be an alternative right and there's no alternative to uh, the goddess's first path because we go to fragment two and we read fragment two here I should have attached all the screenshots to the top of the space from the prior spaces as well, but I'll just read it. So from fragment two, it says, there's two roots of inquiry alone. The one that it is and that it cannot not be. And then the other that it is not and that it needs must not be. And she immediately dismisses number two as just nonsense. So it's not, there's no legitimate path there. There's only one path, at least in my reading. And so if there's only one path, specifically that it is and that it cannot not be then it becomes necessary right because if it's not necessary how else could it be what else? it's like um it's like someone asking me like i saw the other day i made some stupid tweet about it the um why is there something instead of nothing and it's like it's not a legitimate question because nothing in this context is assuming there is an alternative to something to existence but if we can't posit an alternative then the existence becomes the only option the only way um, and therefore yes um, putting aside the question of change I believe that existence or being is a strictly necessary because there's no other possible alternative or option or other way to put it it just it is and and that's you know strictly necessary um, so I guess my my um like um understanding of that is that becoming also exists and that could uh, i guess get one thing with change but it is possible for two states of being to be superimposed upon each other where it looks like the state of becoming or it looks like appears to be something else but that's where i think my um, misunderstanding is is about if there's two coexisting or at the same time superimposed states of being then how do you determine which one is the path? Well, if you, if you are identifying two paths, then they're both on the one path, right? Because what did we see at the top of fragment six? It must be that what is there for speaking and thinking of is, for it is there to be. So if we are talking about two paths, like we're affirming there is path A, there is path B, um, and we are affirming they have affirmative content, we are not really positing an alternative path to that it is and that it cannot not be. What we've done is we've gone down a level and and these two things or ways or paths that we're now talking about, they are part of that first path that it is. Because whatever you talk about, it has to have some sort of affirmative subject or meaning, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking about anything. And so if you've picked out two two things or two paths or two ways um, then it's going to be um, subsumed in that first path and so often I not that you're doing it but but it becomes tricky because we're using very similar words for the, for very different things like we're using which I'm saying there are two paths and it comes under the first path I'm using the word path there in all in all scenarios or contexts when I really shouldn't be because there is only one path and then what what you've done by identifying two things or two ways or two whatever label we want to stick on it you're fleshing out that one path and, and i believe that path is where all meaning exists right all meaning all affirmative content all ontological presence is on that one path the path of truth and you fleshed it out okay so yes yeah, so my understanding then is that even if there's two like superimposed states of being, they still would be within that. Um, they would still be within the context of being, yeah. and not the not being. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. That. Exactly. And so, <clears throat> now, should there be two superimposed ways of being? Uh, that uh, that I don't know. I don't know what. Um, I'm sure people have different ways of of fleshing out the the path of truth or fleshing out what is, um, and that becomes like a it's like a discussion of the details at that point, right? Because 
you know, whatever affirmative meaning or content we're going to discuss and try to flesh out and identify the contradictions and say what is, all of that is happening in the context of the first path, the path of truth. And then, you know, we can argue about the details, but as long as we keep it in that context, and that context comes with certain ramifications, um, one of which is, for example, that everything is. Because if you're in, if you're on that first path, if you're part of what is, then nothing about you can be what is not. I mean, you are completely within that context. You're defined by that context. And that means that everything about you is going to be, you know, inviolate. You can't be destroyed. You weren't created. Um, you're, you're eternal in a sense, just like the, the being is eternal. Because your nature must comply with the nature of being. Um, and that's really what Fragment 8 is going to draw out a lot of those ramifications. Again, it's the longest... I don't know if you were here earlier on, but I went through 6 and 7 today. Um, and I stopped there because Fragment 8 is the longest fragment. Um, it's still the path of truth. Um, and it is going to bring out a lot of those ramifications. It's very long. It's going to take us two or three spaces to get through. Um... But a lot of that, a lot of those, a lot of that stuff is going to be fleshed out in in that fragment. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would say. I would just say people need to be careful in terms of just determining whether or not they're discussing the details of what is or the details of being, or really challenging the idea of being per se. Um, and I think that it gets confused a lot. And and when you were mentioning change. To the extent I don't know to what extent you are mentioning it, but the uh, the problem with change it, it gets into discussions of free will and the like. Th th there seems to be this inherent desire that you see in Plato and Aristotle, actually in Empedocles, all others. I mean, almost everyone. There seems to be this inherent desire to to somehow introduce what is not or a novelty or something new and um i think it, it always leads them into running into trouble um but they want to try to bring in some sort of indeterminacy and uh i don't think it can be done because of the nature of being or the nature of that first path because indeterminacy <clears throat> would be offensive to the first path and the first path is wholly subsuming everything we have to say so where is the indeterminacy coming from? We've already... Well, I have rejected non-being or beyond being. Um, but other people try to to reintroduce or to introduce some sort of being or non-being. And they'll do it in the way you were discussing, Indigo. Not to say you were doing this, but, but in saying that there are different ways of being and whatnot. And then not realizing... Not that you didn't realize, but they will either maliciously or accidentally think that they are speaking about the broadest sense of being when really they're not they've gone down a level and now they're talking about the details and ruining everything um feel free to speak though i see your hands up yeah i think you fleshed out that um that distinction very well for my question that's one of the reasons i didn't ask it was because even if there is the transition state or the um you know, the two states of being, if there is no change, it's always the being. You are always something. It's still the existence, you know. There isn't the indeterminacy because you're always still along that path of truth of being something. You're never, you're never not to be, right? Like the, it's always in the moment, the present, you are still something, you know. Um, so I think uh, that distinction, so, you're speaking of, you know, if they they all converge along the same path, you know, it's the, those in Hattie, she's like, you know, all paths lead to the same direction. It doesn't matter which state you're in, but it would still align with that truth because all things would be. Yeah, you could even there. say, you could even say it doesn't matter what state you're in, you're still in a state, you know? I mean, you don't break the mold and get outside being somehow, you're still in being, you're still in a state. And... To, to go to the questions about change, uh, Tycho, I know his mic was giving out and 
the connection was a bit raspy there but just to speak more about change it's like uh if if anyone goes back to see uh, part two um from a fortnight ago alejandro uh, asked a couple of questions that were interesting and and it was like well we see um things are destroyed like if someone drops a bomb on my car and my car blows up my car is destroyed right it's gone it's nothing it's it's blown to bits and um what my response was and you know alejandro wasn't necessarily saying anything wrong he was like just putting forward a question or, or an interesting point to discuss but fragment seven what does the goddess tell us um nor let habit force you along this route of much experience to ply an aimless eye and ringing ear and tongue but judge by reasoning the very contentious disproof that has been uttered by me so essentially don't just be led astray by your sense perceptions and the accounts given by others um, but use reason and the account of reality the metaphysical account that contentious disproof or much contested account or argument uh, that she has given us and so what happens when we do that well if someone blows up my car you know i may stand here on you know the end of october i may be standing here and say oh my car is blown to smithereens but that doesn't say anything about the car in uh you know in august right the car still exists in august so it's not like it's destroyed out of existence it's just we're talking about something else we have to be very careful about what we're talking about my sense perception of a given moment if we can divide time into moments like this my sense perception of a given moment doesn't tell us about the sense perception of other moments or suggest that those other moments have been destroyed to nothing i mean we're still talking about those other moments and we have no coherent process or system by which they could be annihilated or put outside of being and no longer graspable they're still there so to me my car is yes it got blown up but the car exists as a chronological whole from its manufacturing to its destruction and it, it, it exists as a kind of a whole almost like a complete movie all the scenes of the movie exist and my car is still quite happily in one piece uh last month uh but obviously that doesn't help me this month uh take i see your hand is up feel free to talk um am i um, is my sound any better oh okay no thank you um um so um i guess um the contention i was still having is in, is essentially with i guess it's been highlighted in the conversation you guys have been having but um sort of you, we might be speaking like with different definitions here i'm not i'm not quite sure but you 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 still do realize the like the the difference between what could be that is to say um um my car can be destroyed right now while it's still intact right right now but it could be destroyed maybe in two weeks from now right um this is a possible set of outcomes and what actually is right there's a very significant difference between um what what is what the what is happening in one moment of 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 time and another moment right that is that is a difference in a significant difference in the in being that is to say is there oh it's like you mentioned there's a very significant difference and it's just it it needs to be fleshed out as to why it would be significant and what the difference would be the um so I, but I don't want to strictly object to you because, you know, I have a car and I know that it is significant in some sense if someone blows it up. But, but I'm saying that if the car, like if reality exists as a whole, if being is this complete whole of all that is, then any sort of chronology or series of events, like the chronology is also a complete whole. Like it doesn't lack anything. There's no part of it that's outside of being so the story of the car is also a complete whole and yes it could get blown up and i would be sad i'd have to go get a new car hopefully i'm not in it when it gets blown up i see the significance but i don't see the metaphysical significance i don't think that the car is annihilated i think the story persists um and the car 
you know, if it gets blown up in the story, if it's possible for it to be blown up, it will be blown up. Um, but I don't see any metaphysical significance. I don't think that the car is erased from being and annihilated into nothing. Um, which is what I think that the people who advocate for becoming and change, I think they do believe that whether they realize it or not. I think that they, I think they commit that error of truly believing that whether the car can be blown up or not is yet to be decided or, or whether it is blown up is yet to be decided like it might not happen they believe in a future indeterminacy so the state of affairs where the car is blown up is a literal is not uh, it just is not they could say it, it, it's a it's a possible blown up car but the actual blown up car to them is an is not it does not exist um and then it will come to be and then the car which is now just blasted to smithereens its intact state is somehow like erased from being or no longer exists or it's just like a historical memory but but whatever was real about it has somehow been erased or annihilated or taken outside of being and so that whole it's very contentious and and people will certainly argue with me about that but that I find that not um, very convincing. I, I don't. Um, I don't think that anything gets brought into being. I don't think there is future indeterminacy in that very sense that an actual blown-up car in the future does not exist and will come to be, uh, or that my car will be annihilated from being and it's no longer there in the past. Uh, I think the past is just as real as the present, and the future is just as real as the present too, and the chronology exists as a complete whole just like a movie would exist as a complete whole. Um, I'll give you the last word though, Tycho, and then I'll, I'll go to Indigo if you had anything to add. Maybe Indigo has something to say to you as well. I don't know. Uh, actually, uh, I was going to, but go ahead. Take it. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I am sure I should be done after this for sure. Um, I guess when I, when I, when I, I get, I get that. I, um, I get your explanation there. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I guess what what would be essentially the con what I'm realizing then, I guess, which would be my whole contention is that essentially would be that um, anything that we sort of like apprehend, like in our imagination, that we, that is to say, we think of, right? Be this is what I think is very. It's like it's a very different thing essentially when we start thinking about things rather than things that are. Right, because anything that we can think of sort of like is subsumed in this sort of blocked block of reality, block, block of reality, essentially in some way. And I, I guess my to flesh out the problem essentially was sort of highlighted by Indigo to some extent. And it would be maybe essentially I have a thought in my head that my car blows up in two weeks, and another person has a thought in their head that my car turns green or something they just have a very different thought it's kind of blowing up right in 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 the same time though they think it will happen in the same time right it's sort of a problem of which of the two thoughts uh will necessarily exist in two weeks time essentially um yeah i'm not sure if i sort of character i, I sort of missed that out um clearly enough it's, it's it's essentially like you can sort of have when when it comes to thoughts they sort of like can contradict what reality in very very significant ways it's, that's why we can sort of like flesh out that some things could be even though they never actually do become part of reality but they could be um and some things are yeah, I would just I would just quickly say the because uh, I'll let Indigo have a have a speak, but the um, I would just quickly say that the thoughts are part of reality. Um, they're not outside reality. Thinking is not outside reality. It is also in there. So you have to give the thoughts some sort of presence. Um, I would also say if we have a branching model. So if I say there are two doors in front of me, and I can walk through either one, but only one of them. Um, in my in my interpretation or my modeling of reality i would do actually walk through both it's just a branching plot line right so in one branching part of the chronology or reality i go through door number one and in the second part 
I go through door number two. And so if you say in two weeks, um, which one, you know, what happens? Is it blown up or is it colored green? Well, it could be both. I mean, which two weeks are you saying? Because if both are possible, I think that both will happen. It just at their own time, at their own two week point. There'll be a two weeks where it gets colored green and there'll be a two weeks where it gets blown to bits. Um, but I would I would caution the 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 attempt to tie the the thought to the event that happens to the car because the thoughts are part of being, the car is part of being, the events are part of being, but I don't I, I think there's a lot of uh, groundwork to be done to see how they all tie together. And to think that the thoughts determine what happens to the car seems... Um, not that you necessarily strongly said that the thoughts will determine what happens to the car. And now we have two thoughts saying different things. So how do we resolve it? But I, but I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of discussion to be had about where in being these things are and how they relate. Because I don't necessarily see a problem with one person thinking there'll be a green car, one person thinking there'll be a blown up car and, and how it all plays out or how it all relates. But, but those are just some quick thoughts. I wanted to I wanted to let Indigo speak as well because she mentioned she had uh, some more to say and maybe some comments to make to you as well. Yeah, so I think what the biggest factor here is perception, right? It's the perception of time. Um, for me, the way I think about it and put it in perspective is if at one time it was, then it will always be at that time. And the change of time and the progression of time doesn't change its being at that point. And um, it's the same thing going forward in time as well as you know, going backwards in time. Whatever happens is what would always have happened and what will happen. You know, actions can, I think, maybe... Um, like defer that timeline but if it is then it always will be and there's not much determinism in that um, I think there's free will in you know maybe like pushing things off or in that way but I think most most being it's inevitable you know it's like you know I have a cat you know my cat is dead that does not mean the cat does not exist. The cat did exist, it still exists to me. And um, it kind of comes back to fragment, I think it's fragment five, where uh, she says, and it is all one to me, where I am to begin, for I shall return there again. You know, it's in another time, so in a different place, you know, we're having this conversation as well. Or it might be different factors around it, but all things, it's, the repetition because it is being and it has been and always will be and that doesn't mean that it'll stay that way there will be other times where other things be exist have a different existence but that doesn't negate the other times it was something or another way to look at it is um, I know I've used this example before um, and I forget who said it, but I think it starts with a D, of the idea of a ball bouncing on a roof, right? So at one point, the ball is not touching the roof. At a point, the ball is on the roof. So at what point is it, is it the becoming? Because it's not that there's two different points of being, but one doesn't negate the other because it was that before, and it will be the other thing. So the change doesn't really exist. It's just the two different states of being. But the difference of it is the perspective of how it's being viewed in the concept of time. Yeah, that was... Um, thank you, Indigo. I just wanted to add, uh, I mentioned earlier in the space, uh, Diodorus Cronus, I think actually in response to Tycho. And so what Indigo just mentioned there, Tycho with the um the ball you know when does it touch the roof is it when it's in the air or when it's on the roof um where is this point of touching or or transition from the air to being resting on the roof the um that that that's from diodorus cronus uh, preserved in uh, sextus empiricus thank you i hope, I hope that was helpful for the understanding <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, no, I, I, I found it helpful. The um, there's so much to be said. <laughs> there's so much to be said about these fragments, and you brought us back to fragment five as well. And you had a had your own um, sort of almost cyclical interpretation. Well, it's a cyclical fragment, but but uh, another interpretation of it, or slightly slightly adjusted interpretation of it, which is great. The um, it's already been. Oh, geez, it was an hour and a half since I started the actual recording for YouTube, but the space was probably going for 15, 20 minutes before then. So the uh, I thought this was going to be a really quick space, <laughs> and we're almost at two hours again. The um, if anyone has any comments, please um, please raise your hand. I I'm glad we got through six and seven. The uh, like I said, we didn't reach them in in the last one. We're going to do fragment eight probably the first half or first third of that um i'll probably do it again on friday next week friday is just a good time for me but um like i was saying fragment eight will probably take us two or three spaces and um, it's going to flesh out a lot of the ramifications um and really describe the nature of being it, it, it's sort of we've already hit upon how the first path is that it is and it cannot not be and so we're talking about everything that is or anything with any sort of affirmative meaning or presence just existence writ large like all that could be referenced or talked about or thought about and indeed speaking and thinking itself is also subsumed in in being and again there was a good discussion of that in part two as well uh with ancient and others the um what we're going to find in part eight is that is not just directly addressed but a lot of the ramifications like what flows from that like once you have this understanding that literally everything is literally everything you could mention or point at is something it has some sort of affirmative presence and that there is no alternative no other option beyond that once you accept that or you've got that point in mind a whole lot of things flow from there um which, you know, I briefly touched on saying, you know, if, if something is subsumed by being or is part of being, then its nature will be defined by that system or context of being in being. Um, and again, Melissus also has that. He says, you know, fine, there can be fire, water, earth, whatever. You can have all those things. But whatever you say about them, however you treat them, they have to be just as the one is. For him, being is, you know, the one if i can make that leap so he's saying fine you can have all these things but they have to comply with the nature of the one or be as the one is um and so what the rest of parmenides is going to do and again i'm not going to read the fragments today it's eight is the longest fragment um i believe it's the longest should be the longest the um it's going to be dragging out a lot of what it means for um for all this stuff like what are the ramifications of being part of being it's going to have to to meet all these standards and behave in a certain way and it's going to be you know it's like a, a <clears throat> i want to say ancient in part two was discussing gradation right it's not going to admit of gradation or dilution or a concentration and dilution there's not going to be any gradation of what is real there's not going to be things that are more real and things that are less real everything is going to be equally existent in an absolute and inviolate sense um and so any sort of system that's saying you know like uh, the gods are more real and we're less real we're only partially real and we can be destroyed or something like that not to malign the gods but just any sort of system where there's an existential gradation is going to have to be given up so that will go away <laughs>